you guys doing today? Please join me for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit brings me before you in the name of Jesus Christ to submit myself as you use me to deliver your word to your people. And I'm choosing to pray to you the words that were once prayed by my sister Carrie Gordon. Help us to feel on the inside as good as we look on the outside. I thank you for everything you've been teaching me. I thank you for this family that you've blessed me with. And I just pray that you cleanse all of us right now. Cleanse me, cleanse our family, so that your word may be delivered effectively. That everyone will receive it, that it may transform hearts, transform lives, and help us to know you better. Learn something about your character and learn something about ourselves and enhance the relationship that we have with you. We thank you that your Holy Spirit is here. I am in agreement with my, my brother Greg's prayer that we know, we believe that you are here and we delight in the fact that you are here receiving our prayers. We believe that you are here enjoying the singing that we're given to you. And we know that we couldn't do that. We know that that wouldn't be acceptable to you if it weren't for Jesus Christ. So we thank you for the gift of Christ. We thank you for everything that you do in the name of Christ. One of the most insightful teachings that has helped me to better understand our Christian faith is the distinction between having peace with God and experiencing the peace of God. When we talk about having peace with God, then we are referring to the fact that we are sinful and we deserve to be punished. We deserve to experience the wrath of God, but because God loved us and he poured out his wrath onto Jesus Christ, Jesus took the punishment in our place, we are spared of the punishment that we deserve. And if we accept to allow Jesus to stand before God and represent us, then we are spared the punishment and the wrath of God. We now have peace with God. But when we talk about the peace of God, it's something completely different. It's referring to the inner calm that we have in the face of some of the greatest adversities that we face in this sinful world. It's the kind of peace that Job demonstrated when he lost all his money and all his kids died and he caught this terrible disease, but he was still able to say, naked I came into this world, naked I'm going to leave. God gives, God takes away. Praise God. In the middle of some of the worst situations for you to still be able to stand strong and say that, that is when you experience the peace of God. But what I discovered is that, ironically, in the body of Christ, the majority of Christians, although we know we're saved and we have peace with God, we know that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, we know that, and we have peace with God, but the majority of Christians, including me, don't always experience the peace of God. We freak out in situations, even though we're supposed to believe and we claim that we believe that our God is big, we claim that we believe that our God is in control, we claim that he, we believe that he's sovereign, but we freak out in situations and they affect us. We get frustrated, we get angry, we get sad. Christians are always plagued with depression. You have Christians committing suicide. How does that happen? The title of our message this morning is Both Pieces. I don't want to sound greedy, but I want both pieces. And I want you to say to yourself, I want both pieces. I know that I'm saved. I know that I'm going to be in heaven. I know that. But I want to have the courage. I want to have the peace that Job had. And when I discovered that I suffer from this disease, this lack of peace, when I discovered, when it hit me, that I may be suffering from this disease, and many of my brothers and sisters in the body of Christ may be suffering from the same disease. When I discovered that, I hungered for the answer. I wanted to understand what is it that causes Christians to experience a lack of peace? What causes that? Where does that come from? So I went where the answers, all the answers are. I prayed to my God, and he graciously led me to the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah... Many of you are familiar with the story, but for those who aren't, I'll tell you the story. It's about a prophet of God, a person of God who experienced a tremendous lack of peace in one of the greatest successes of his life. Jonah was a prophet. 
and he was entrusted with preaching the word of God. And he did that one day in one of the greatest cities in his time. He preached to Nineveh, and everybody in Nineveh got converted. Everybody in Nineveh changed their lives. Everybody in Nineveh recognized the error of their ways, including the king. Imagine me preaching in New York, the biggest city in, in, in America. Well, I wouldn't say that, but one of the biggest cities in America, and everybody in New York recognizes the need to come to Christ. The mayor gets on television and says, you know those guys at Origin came by today? Carl preached his sermon, and we all, we're not living right. We need to change our lives. Imagine that. But during that success as a prophet of God, Jonah was upset by that outcome. He was extremely angry. He was very frustrated to the point where the Bible says he wanted to die. He wanted to die. He was very angry that these people had come to God. Well, for you to truly understand what's going on here, I have to give you the whole story. I can't give you one piece. I got to give you both pieces, right? The reason Jonah was so upset is because he didn't like the Ninevites. God called him to go preach to the Ninevites, but he had a bad history with the Ninevites. The Ninevites were abusive, oppressive, hostile, and sometimes torturous to the Israelites, and Jonah did not like them. He believed that they deserved punishment, that they deserved to be condemned and obliterated. But he knew that if he, pre if he preached to them and they got converted, that they would come to God and God would love them and forgive them. He didn't want God to forgive them. He didn't want them to experience the relationship that he had with God. He felt that they deserved to be punished. Therefore, he didn't want to preach to them. As a matter of fact, when God first came to him, he actually tried to escape. He got on a ship heading in the opposite direction. He didn't want to go to Nineveh. He got on a ship heading to Tarshish. But if you know the story, you know that God sent a tremendous storm that disturbed his travels and upset the sea. And the sailors that were on that storm were panicking. They were all freaking out. And everybody was going around telling each other to pray to their respective gods. They didn't believe in one true God. Everybody was relying on a variety of things in their life and people in their life and you know, idols in their life. So they were praying to those things, hoping to calm the sea, but it wasn't happening. So Jonah then surfaced to come clean and admit to them that the reason all of this is happening is because of me. I serve the God of the universe, the God who commands all that he sees, and he is causing all of this. So if you want to stop this storm, if you want to calm this storm, throw me overboard. But these guys were hesitant in doing that. They didn't really want to throw him overboard because they're figuring, you know, if your God can do all of this, I don't want him to be mad at me. <laughs> so they didn't want to throw him overboard. They were hesitant in doing that. But he insisted, and they eventually did. And when they did, when they did the storm did calm. And that actually brought a lot of those guys to worship God because they recognized God's power. When they threw him overboard, the star storm was calm. But Jonah, on the other hand, was dying in the water. He was drowning. Seaweed was wrapping around his neck. And he was about to die. But in his last breath, he called out to God, and God did, in fact, save him. God sent a large fish to engulf him. This large fish swallowed Jonah up, and Jonah comes to consciousness in the belly of this fish. And when he Finds himself there, he starts to pray to God like we all do when we end up in trouble, when we end up in a jam. He praised God. He made promises to God, vows to God. And God eventually commanded the, the, the fish to spit Jonah out onto dry land. And then he comes back to him again, the consistent God that we have, and tells him to do the same thing that he told him initially. Go to Nineveh and preach this sermon. So, no, so Jonah did. He goes to Nineveh. He preached that sermon. He did it grudgingly. He preached a doom and gloom sermon. God is going to destroy you. Change your life. <laughs> but the people embraced it. God caused the people to embrace it, and everybody changed their life. And Jonah was mad about that. So here we have a guy who has peace with God. He's with God. The fact that God came to him indicates that he's a person of God. Just like God comes to you and me where we're entrusted to do ministry, he calls on us to go and serve others and to do certain things. We do Thanksgiving drives and Christmas drives, and we're called to do ministry. We're going out there helping to feed the homeless. We do that, right? So we're with God. We have the peace with God. But Jonah obviously did not experience the peace of God because this brother wanted to die at every turn. 
Every step of the way in the book of Jonah, you'll discover that there are several occurrences where Jonah was so frustrated that he wanted to die. What's going on? What's going on with a person of God that you are in the middle of a success? You are in the middle of something good happen, something that God calls you to do, empowers you to do. You go and you do it. It turns out great, and you're angry. What's happening? This story illustrates, if you read the story carefully, you'll start to grasp one of the greatest threats to your peace and my peace. One of the greatest threats that we have to our peace is self-righteousness. One of the greatest threats that we have that makes us lose our peace as people of God is self-righteousness. Let me take that apart. Self-righteousness in itself is a distortion of one of God's greatest gifts to us. God gave us the gift, the capacity of moral reasoning. We can determine that something is right or wrong. We can actually look at something. The animals don't have that capacity. If somebody steals something from you, they steal your car, the response you have tells you that that's not a good thing. You don't have to be taught that thou shalt not steal for you to instinctively respond to see that stealing is not a good thing. So God has given us the moral, the capacity for moral reasoning. We can literally, you know, determine that this is right and this is wrong. But what's happened is, is we've started to idolize that capacity where we start to rely on it and we believe that we actually can discern between right or wrong without consulting with the person that created the standard of right to begin with, who is the standard of right. So we now determine that we know what's right and what's wrong. That's why when arguments happen, each person is defending what they believe is right. <laughs> You're defending the, po the point of view that you think is right. The other person is defending what they think is right. But neither one are consulting with the standard of right. And we've become so absorbed and this capacity is so distorted and so broken because of our sinful nature that even when we learn that God, what he says, conflicts with what we think is right, we actually defend what we think. We actually rely more on the stuff that we believe is right, even when it comes into conflict with what God says is right. And this starts to affect our ministry because it causes us to be judgmental. We look at people that are not doing what we do, believe what we believe, and we determine them to be wrong. Then we identify with people that do agree with us, that do see it our way, and we start to form little circles of people that agree. And then we look and we say we're right and they're wrong. And God forbid you're with God, when you're a person of God, not only do you look at people as being wrong because they are not you, <laughs> you're wrong because you're not me, but now you're double wrong because you're not with God. So the people of God actually are even more self-righteous than the world, than the regular human being, because even as a human, you think you, you know what's right. But now when you come to God, you think you know what's right double. You're double right. So you become judgmental. You're judgmental. You look at people and you start carving out these little circles of people and pointing out who's wrong, and you look at yourself as being right. This same judgmentalness leads to exclusion of people and gracelessness. Several years ago, I was having a conversation with a friend, and this is before I had a firm foundation in faith. I didn't have any firm belief system, and we were happened to be talking about uh, immigration and border control. My friend was very passionate about that, and he just felt that, you know what, we need to be enforcing stricter border control in the United States. We don't need to let people migrate in here, and I gave some wimpy argument to him about how, how could we do that when we all came from somewhere? You know that little wimpy argument, but he seemed like he was prepared for this one, and he started to explain to me, he started to draw a picture for me about how the more people are in a certain place, then the less resources are available to people, and the quality of living starts to be diminished because of the more people, so the idea is that we have to do population control and keep the people down so that we can have a higher quality of living. That was his perspective. I was a little resistant, but didn't have many arguments to give, then he drove it home. And he said, imagine you have a house, you know, you spend all this money, you work hard, and you've got this beautiful home. And a homeless guy comes knocking on the door. And he wants to stay there for a while. He said, Carl, would you let him? 
at the time, it sounded rational. It made sense to me at the time. You know, you're probably right. That makes sense. I probably shouldn't. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking there's a lot of reasons you shouldn't, safety issues. But today, in my belief system today, now that I've come to Christ and I'm starting to understand what Christ is saying to us, I realize that for me to decline someone, the use of resources that are available to me, is me saying that I deserve these resources, you don't, because I work for them, and I did what I had to do to get them, and you didn't, and you're in a situation you're in because you deserve it. And by me doing that, I'm discounting the fact that everything that I have was given to me. The very breath that I have to get up and walk and work, the intelligence that I have to work, the, the strength that I have to work. If God wanted me to wander the wilderness crazy like he did Nebuchadnezzar, like an animal, he could do that like this, and I could end up just losing my mind. But he permits me, he allows me every day to have the courage and have the strength. And when I give to you, when I share my resources with you, then what I'm doing is I'm testifying to the grace of God. I'm giving you the grace that I've received. I'm acknowledging that God has done something for me. Someone has given me something that I don't deserve because I'm no different than you. And now that you are in need, I'm going to give to you because someone did the same thing for me. I don't deserve the things that I have. But the problem is that we really believe that we are right. Jonah's idea was that he was with God because he was entitled to be with God. He was a person of God that was a good person. These guys were bad people. They were bad people. These guys tortured people. They killed people. They murdered people. They deserve punishment. He made that determination. But in God's wisdom, who doesn't want any of us to be lost, who doesn't want any of us to perish, in God's wisdom, God wants to save everyone. And when God makes that call and you disagree with God's call because you're more defending of your position and what you believe is right, you're right in yourself, you're right and you're relying on the, your determination of what's right and it comes into conflict with what God is saying, how could you experience peace? How could you experience peace when you are in conflict with what God is saying? What is the solution then? What is the solution? How is it that we can resolve this problem? If we discover that self-righteousness, this self-righteousness gets in the way of you and I enjoying the peace that God wants us to have, what's the remedy? Repentance. Repentance is the remedy. Repentance involves recognizing that you are wrong, recognizing the error of your ways, recognizing that you are wrong or you're just as wrong. You have situations where you look at people that have departed away from the word, they've departed away from, from faith, and then they come back, and all of a sudden they forget, like me sometimes, forget that I was exactly the same person that I'm looking at. But God is still working on that person. I'm looking at that person at a moment in time. And I'm making a determination that that person is behaving in a way that's not of God. And I'm forgetting the days that I was out there lost and doing exactly the same thing that he was doing. How am I going to find peace? But by recognizing that this in itself, by recognizing that this in itself, this idea of judging other people, is something that falls short of God's glory. By recognizing that, that deter me insisting on my way over God's way, that in itself needs to be repented of. Then you start to discover and find peace. Many people read the book of Jonah and they see it. They question our freedom of choice. They say, well, why doesn't God just allow you to do what you want to do? Jonah didn't want to preach to Nineveh. Why didn't God just allow him to go and, pre and, and not preach to Nineveh? Because when you give God authority over your life, when you claim to be a person of God, when you have now come to God, don't expect him now to just sit back and not correct you and not redirect you. When you, when you, de when you deviate 
away from. I don't know any one of you in here that has a loved one that was to start drinking and want to get behind the wheel of a vehicle and you would let them and you would allow them to do it without trying to stop them. The storm that took place, the storm that took place there on the sea when Jonah was running away from what God called him to do, that storm was a storm of love. It was an intervention of love. And Jonah was the embodiment of the sin that lives in our lives. And that storm and that disturbance that is taking place is God saying, no, you're not going in the right direction. That is not where I want you to go. And since you've given me authority, since you call yourself my child, I'm not going to let you go there and be in peace. So when you're living with a sin in your life and you're living with a sinful nature in your heart and things that are, that are coming up in your, your mind, you know, judgmentalness, unforgiveness, resentment, the stuff that people sometimes can't see, when you have that in your heart, God is not going to let you be at peace because you've given him authority. So when Jonah decided that he was going to go the opposite direction of what God had called him to do, God was not going to just sit back and leave that. Like my man, um, Neil says all the time, God ain't no punk. What kind of a father is going to allow his son just to jump in the car knowing that he's been drinking to take the keys and to just speed off? You're going to permit that over my dead body. And that's exactly what God has done over his dead body. Over his dead body, that's not going to happen. When Adam and Eve decided to sin and go the opposite direction, they took all of humanity on a trip to Tarshish. We got on a ship to Tarshish. Jesus Christ is the storm that intervenes. Jesus Christ is a storm that intervenes. He comes in now, and when he came to earth, when he was here on earth, it was chaotic, and the religious leaders were fearful because he was threatening to break up their ship. <laughs> and what Jesus was saying was, throw me overboard, and the, and the storm is going to be calm. <laughs> throw me overboard, and they did just that. And now the storm is calm, and we have the capacity, we have the ability to have our peace restored. Don't look at the disturbances that occur when you don't feel at peace when, when you don't feel at peace because your point of view is coming in conflict with God, look at that as an act of love. Recognize that there must be something wrong with the way that I'm looking at it because God is perfect. There must be some self-serving idea that I'm holding on to, that I'm clinging on to, that is an, an idol to me. Jonah, when he was in the belly of the beast, he was saying that those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. And he didn't even realize that he was clinging to the idol of his own identity, the, his identity as a person of God. He was so exclusive, and he wanted to keep his little exclusive Israelite club together. But he didn't want these people to participate in the benefits that God, he knew that God was a loving and compassionate God, and he didn't want those people to receive it. That little judgmental thing in his heart, you think God didn't know that before God called on him to do a ministry? There's something called sanctification when you come to God. Not only are you saved, there's salvation, but God promises that he's going to make you white as snow. He's going to transform you. You bring to him a bunch of dirt and a bunch of baggage. And he says, I'm going to conform you to my character. And what God does is he takes you and he makes you come face to face with ministries that pull out that dirty part of your heart. You find yourself being called into ministries that frustrate you. What is it saying about you? What is, what is God trying to teach you about your heart? What is he trying to teach you? Jonah's exclusiveness, his idea of wanting to keep his little club together and not let anybody else in, and his resentment and judgmentalness of wanting to punish those guys because they deserve it. All of that, God was showing him. I want that to change in your heart. I want that to change in your heart. You know why? Because you're not at peace, Jonah. Yes, you're with me. I'm going to trust you to do ministry. Yes, you're, my, you're one of my people. Yes, you are. But I'm going to strip this out of you. I'm going to rip that out of your character. And now that answers for me why we as a body sometimes experience that lack of peace. We're coming into conflict. Our personal agendas, our personal point of views, what we determine is right and what should be. I ask God to bless me with a business Bless me with a beautiful wife. And then I get frustrated because, hey, the business is consuming me too much and I can't spend time with my beautiful wife. 
How about that? How ironic. This stuff happens to us in every situation that we place ourselves in. We determine that this should be the way it is. God blesses you with that business and it's working out really well. And then comes the Sabbath. And all of a sudden, you determine that it's right because you've got more work to do than to take that time off. But the Sabbath is there every week. It comes every single week. And it's always a reminder to me. It makes me have to face that I'm not surrendering to God because every time it comes around, I always feel overloaded with a bunch of work that's not finished, that I'm not done. And in stopping, I'm coming face to face with the lack of surrender that I suffer from in my life. In stopping, every time I've got to stop and I'm feeling that pull, when I really surrender is when I'm going to truly find the peace. When I truly surrender to God is when I'm truly going to experience his peace. When that day comes around, I'm going to experience it completely different when I truly give up and recognize that the business I have would not function without God. So, surrender. This morning, I want to invite you to have a prayer of surrender, of renewed surrender. It's going to take for us to recognize that we are not right the standard that we have to measure ourselves against is the standard of God. We have to refer to what he says to us. We have to look at his word and internalize his word and understand what God is requiring of us. And if we come into conflict with that, if our body is telling us that this is not what you want to do, we have to recognize that we are the ones that are wrong. We have to recognize that. And that's surrender. And that repentance, that turning away from your self-righteousness and feeling that you're right and debating and fighting and resisting, that is what's going to bring about peace. So I want to invite you guys, I want to invite our praise team to come back up. And I realize that this is a very short sermon, but it doesn't have to be long. This is a message that God has taken me through. This is a message that God has taught me when I experience a lack of peace and I prayed to him. He led me to come to this understanding. And I wanted to share that with you because I know that sometimes you experience a lack of peace. We sing certain songs. Like this afternoon, I think we're going to sing a song. Um, I surrender all and holding, withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. And we sing these songs over and over again. I surrender all, withholding nothing. Use me. We say this stuff to God. And then he calls you to go and minister to somebody that offended you. <laughs> and you don't want to do it. Your body is saying, I don't want to go and bring this brother a birthday present. I, I just don't feel like doing that. And it frustrates you when you get called into ministry to do something like that. God is asking you to get out of your comfort zone, buy a less expensive car and, you know, help somebody that may need it. But no, you got to have it. Got to have that Maserati. Got to have that Ferrari, can't you? Do you recognize that God is saying, Matthew 5, I have to read. I have to read this, this passage. I have to read this passage. I avoided reading a whole lot because uh, I was a little nervous this morning, but I have to read this passage. Matthew chapter 5, 38 to 42, right? 39? Okay, here we go. You guys know your, you know your Bible, don't you? Oh, it's on the screen. Oh, <laughs> the cheat sheet. <laughs> you have heard it said, you have heard it, you have heard that it was said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Everything in here contradicts what we desire to do. If someone wants to take something from you, you want to take it back. You want to hold on to it. You don't want. I want you to come up. Come on up. Come on up. 
because we're going to have a prayer of submission and surrender. Someone takes something from you, your body resists letting them take anything from you. You don't want evil people to receive anything. Your heart tells you that evil people deserve punishment. That's what your heart tells you. That's what your body is saying. Your body is saying that I don't have enough for myself. God is telling me right here to give what I have to other people if they come to me. Don't deny them. Well, what if I haven't taken care of the things that I desire yet? By doing it, you're demonstrating that you trust God. That you're going to listen to the things that he tells you to do and recognize that I'm wrong. I don't see the money that I will have. God sees the money that I will have. I don't see the money. So when he's telling me to give a portion of it to someone because they ask me and don't deny them, I have to admit to myself and repent that, you know what, this resistance that I'm having right now, that's of me. Self-protection. I'm protecting myself. I'm not trusting in God. When, when I look at other people that I believe deserve to be punished rather than me now coming in and hugging them and loving them, I struggle with that even with raising children. I struggle with graceful parenting when your child does something and God is saying, you know what, demonstrate to them the forgiveness that I've demonstrated towards you. Yeah. That's tough. Take your time. Take your time. I struggle with that. And I know that the stuff I'm touching on, I know that the majority of us here experience all of it. God tells us to surrender and submit to him. And I know the young people in this room sometimes, when your parents are advising you sometimes, you resist that. You have to recognize that what God says is what is right. He is the standard of right. When you can surrender to that, accept that, repent of your position and your posture, that's when peace starts to happen that's when you can start to have both pieces both pieces the peace with God as well as the peace of God so let's pray a renewed prayer of renewed surrender and repentance to God Heavenly Father the stuff that you ask us to do feels like torture sometimes because our sinful nature takes over and it comes into conflict with us it tells us things that are comfortable. It tells us things that are self-serving. We try to serve our appearance, our image, our identity, our significance. We try to find all of those things in other things of this world. So we insist that we have to have the homes that make us appear significant. We have to have the cars that make us appear significant. And we're not trusting that our significance lies in you. We're not believing that the affection that we need lies in you. Our body is telling us that we would need to go and commit that adultery to find affection. Our body is telling us we need to cut corners and to steal and to lie in order for us to have the things that we desire when you're telling us to trust you and even things that we can't see. But our sinful nature resists trusting you. So our prayer this morning is that you Bring us to repentance. Bring us to the recognition of the error of our ways. To recognize that we are wrong. That it's our nature that is wrong. That what we want to do that contradicts what you said, you're the one that is right, we're the one that is wrong. So my prayer this morning is that everyone in this room, everyone in your, in your family, in this body of Christ, receives the peace that you want us to enjoy. We know that we have peace with you. We know that there's no more condemnation for us. We know that you are not going to punish us the way that we deserve to be punished. We know that if we've accepted Christ as our Savior, for those of us who have, we know that you're not going to punish us and we're not going to feel your wrath. We have peace with you. But we don't want to have to wait until we get to heaven to enjoy life. We're alive now. People that are not with you are considered dead in their trespasses, but we're alive. So we don't want to live like we're dead. We don't want to be depressed. We want to experience what we preach to people, how you are a sovereign God and that we are in good care, we are in good hands, that you are powerful, that you can take care of any situation, no matter how bad it looks to us. Let us not trust in what we could see, but let us believe that you have everything under control. We thank you for everything, Father. We thank you for all that you do. In the name of your Son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. I said no to you.
everything I give to you with all nothing with all nothing but I God today, everything. Everything I give to you. With all and nothing. With all and nothing. With all and nothing. Say, I surrender. I surrender all to you. Everything I give. I give you all of me. 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 I give